everyday morning, we will have our service of giving thanks to the Lord for the blessings he's given us in this past year at 8 o'clock. Nice and early so you can make it home. Uh, many years before I even got here, it was moved to 8 o'clock because not just of uh, football games on TV, but also in local high school games. So really, uh, there's nothing you'll miss if you come here at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there's no games going on at all. So please come, please join us. On Saturday at 6 o'clock, we have our annual greeting. Uh, we'll be decorating on the inside of the church to get it all Christmassy in here in the hall over there. The Ferraros sent me a message last night that they are in safely from out of the country. Do you remember stuff where they went? No. So I guess they're watching online. And uh, Tony will actually have the opportunity to preach next week. As I'll be taking a week off, please give him a nice welcome if you would. Um, let's see. So they got in, but they got in either late last night or they're getting in early this morning. I don't remember which. But they wouldn't be able to make it here. Um, also, Lori Crossin, who has been attending, but we've been praying for her quite often with her uh, cancer and her treatment, which is, she said, describes as just as bad as the cancer itself, uh, is feeling really sick this morning. So please put keep her in prayer. She said she would not be able to make it with us this morning. Um, we did have. About seven, eight, nine days ago, our council down in Maryland. Am I on? Can you hear me through this? There we go. Hi, we have a council down in Maryland. We have once a year, I'll, I'll tell you a little more about it, but uh, diocesan council where the bishop uh, gave an exhortation. He asked the pastors to share it in their own way with the congregation. So this morning I'm going to share it with you a, a special message from the bishop, and I brought in some other passages of scripture also to just enliven it, work it into our service this morning. And I hope it will be an encouragement to everyone here as he intended it to be. So with that, we will begin with our call to worship, which is on the cover of your bulletin. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our opening hymn is number 447.
Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy
to this house. And they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this disaster on them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sit upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The next he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Uh, once a year, our diocese uh, meets together uh, for two days, uh, organizationally, but really mostly it's for prayer and training for clergy. Just as an FYI, uh, our particular diocese is from uh, basically New York City, where we have three churches, or two, one in Manhattan, one in Brooklyn, one in Newark down to Baltimore, and it's pretty much right in that corridor there. Um, it's very different, actually, from when I first came into the church, probably about 30 years ago, when there was a lot of debates and discussions that went on in these meetings. Now, uh, it's mostly teaching sessions. There's really nothing to debate about like we used to have. Um, and the main message, which kind of led us off, was from our Bishop Chuck who was here last November, and he asked the pastors to share with the churches what was his exhortation about reaching out to the community where we live. He began with a reflection on uh, some church models, which were very common back in the 70s to the 90s, of church growth, some of the positive things and some of the problems which came out of them. Uh, most of the church growth models were in the form of what people called mega churches. Uh, the big one of these was in Chicago called Willow Creek. There were others that followed their particular model. Certainly a lot of positive things, but a lot of problems that came out of this kind of mega church model as well, and maybe not even necessarily with the first church, but how a lot of people tried to copy them. Uh, first, most of the churches tried to redesign their whole, they rethink basically what do we do on Sunday morning? And the idea became, how can we make church seeker friendly? Uh, how can we change our church service so it's more friendly and inviting to non Christians was kind of the idea. Um, well, if we're going to do that, we need to get rid of some older traditional concepts, you know, preaching about sin and things like holiness, uh, topics like hell. That doesn't really fit with a seeker friendly service for people who really don't want to go to church in the first place, right? So, liturgy. Liturgy is a tough one, really, when you think about it as well, because you're kind of forcing people to. Uh, participate. People like to sit back and watch. So a lot of those churches, they get rid of all those things. Not all churches were like this, of course. Now, Coral Ridge down in Florida is a great example of a church that didn't get rid of and jettisoned a lot of these things. Uh, the Igreys were a part of that particular church. Uh, Dr. James Kennedy, you may have heard of him. A great pastor. I still listen to a lot of his sermons because you can find him on YouTube. Um, but anyway, I don't think it's really much of a coincidence taking them aside. When you take God's word and you decide, I'm going to water it down so when I preach and what our church represents going out in the world really sounds nice to non-Christians, doesn't offend them, doesn't bother them, well, is it really surprising when you tell unbelievers what they want to hear their lives really aren't going to be changed by that, right? And when you tickle their heart, you tickle their ears, their hearts are not going to be 
changed. And it's not really hard to see how you can take that and you can see kind of at the same time how the church itself lost its moral foundation because it lost being dependent on the Word of God. The second big problem with the growth of these bigger churches is they really actually didn't reach out to many non-Christians. What they ended up doing was drawing most of their new members from smaller, kind of family-centered churches. Um, there's a lot of anonymity in these larger churches. And a lot of people find it attractive to go to a church where kind of nobody knows them and they can sit back and... Um, it's kind of the, the small church curse, you could kind of say, that a lot of people always feel, you know, I don't like it because if, if I don't do this thing that I know needs to get done, nobody's going to do it, are they? I, I have to be there to get it done. And, and sometimes we can get frustrated with that. We can say, wouldn't you like to go somewhere where they have somebody on the staff and he does the thing? And he's paid to do the thing. And it doesn't need volunteers. So... The big question is, we're not a church like that. In fact, really only one of the churches in our diocese that has a really nice uh, academy is able to have a decent staff. Otherwise, the other 23 in our church, we don't have staffs, we don't have people that do the things. We depend on one another to do the things that need to be, get done. We don't want to compromise our statements about holiness and sin, uh, how can we affect society? That's the real question. So the bishop said he would read this past summer rereading, actually, a book called Signs of the Apostles. And there was a striking portion of the book which had to deal with revival. It's revival. And the book said, certainly the modern church should long for and pray for revival. And those in our community would hear the gospel, believe, and be inspired to spread it. Uh, the church should petition God for a wider spread of his truth and ask for righteousness in his people and in society. God's people should request that many come to know his gracious salvation. Nevertheless, they must realize that for a revival, there is no necessity for super holy so that's going to be our foundation this morning. God uses ordinary Christians who are engaged every day with a desperate struggle over their own flesh against the devil to magnify his greatness in revival. Instruments that are going to be greatly used by God have to be people who are actively fighting temptation in their lives, praying that God is going to remove sin from our hearts so that we can pray the same thing and try to live the same thing for others. A uh, great example from the Bible, I'm going to share with you a couple of Bible examples here, but the first one that came to the bishop's mind and said is Luke 5. Where you have Peter, he sees this great miraculous catch of fish basically jump into his net. That his, after Jesus borrows his boat to preach to the people. And he realizes the holiness of God, his presence. And he falls down on his knees, not in worship, but in terror. And he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The presence of God filled him with fear and realizing his unworthiness. He knew he couldn't stand in the presence of the Savior, and he was too unclean to be considered a disciple for Jesus. Jesus, of course, immediately replied, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. It's as if Christ said, Now that you're actually fully aware of your own moral impurity, that you really can't do it of your strength, Peter. You're, you're prepared now to serve me. You see this quite often in the Old Testament when the prophets are called. Isaiah is a great example in Isaiah 6. When they're called to mighty works, the calls usually begin with a conscious awareness 
of their own personal impurity. In the same way, God kept harassing Paul, and this is one thing we don't always think of, with what Paul describes as a thorn in his side, but other places, he kind of reveals it as kind of this kind of secret, but huge temptation, which kept gnawing away at him. And it's, it said, God said to him, I'm doing this so you won't see yourself as greater than all of these others. For his humility, God made Paul face the fact that he needed God to stand up against temptation. It wasn't something that he, even he, the great apostle, could do of his own efforts. God didn't spread the gospel of Christ through the worldly means of great extroverts with incredible personalities. He chose apostles for their, he didn't choose apostles, excuse me, because of their great strength of character. The church wasn't begun by 12 emperors, by 12 political slaves of Rome. Most of the apostles, you read through, they were very far from being scholars. They were ordinary men with ordinary professions. His choice of evangelists had no warriors, no Madison Avenue publicity men. And as a group, the apostles had really no outstanding personalities that would explain why did these particular guys have just such an incredible impact on the world. Often, we, we can think of ourselves, uh, am I really good enough to share the gospel with others? Can I really be someone used of great works? Um, a lot of times we think, you know, shouldn't I be somebody maybe with a great academic skill? And we look for that, or we might look for uh, maybe like a football player. He has, and, and there's nothing wrong with these things, there's nothing wrong with academics, there's nothing wrong with... Uh, professionals who are quite known in the world to share their testimony with others. And, but oftentimes we see that while the crowds might come, they're not always changed. And the question is, why would they really be changed when we appeal to what the world considers greatness in order to try to show them God's greatness? What do we see in God's word? He doesn't grab celebrities. Uh, one, uh, some of the most profound examples of sharing the gospel come from places you would never expect. In John chapter 4, you have this wonderful story of the Samaritan woman at the well. A woman who had been married, I think it was five times. She was living with this sixth guy. And you would think, who is she? The whole town knows her story. The whole, whole town knows what kind of a woman this was. But God didn't wait for her to have a, a nice and holy reputation among the people before he used her to bring that entire town where she lived to Christ, to hear him. God used her just as she was, because she was willing to be used by him. Because when she heard what Christ had to say, she believed. The blind man in John 9, a couple chapters later there, uh, he was called to witness to the greatest Bible scholars on earth and really teach them lessons about what God's word had to say and, and just days after his conversion. A man born blind. God doesn't need our great personal talents, our wisdom, our personal attempts at holiness, our strengths. He desires us in our weakness. He desires us when we say, I can only do this, Lord, through you, through your spirit. He just wants us to be willing. And this is because revival depends on the sovereign blessing of God, first and foremost. A God who uses humble people who have real flaws that rely on his grace. The people in the town of Corinth, I, I love using them because they have so many interesting examples, but they fell into this trap that believing to be a successful ministry, 
they had to have what they considered to be a super apostle as their leader. And that's kind of why they decided they weren't going to listen to Paul anymore. And that's what really the first and second Corinthians, these letters, were all about. Them asking Paul to send a list of references, even though he was the one who founded the church in Corinth. Now they want his resume. Um, why? Well, you know, he could write a good letter, but his appearance compared to some other people at the time it was kind of laughable. He was short, he was a little bit lame in the way he walked. He really wasn't a good speaker, apparently. Um, you can read about that in Acts, where actually one time he preached so long a guy fell asleep and fell out the window. Um, much like our own diocese, many of the churches which Paul founded, they were troubled. They were financially struggling day to day, and they really couldn't support it. Corinth was that big church. They were the richest city in that whole area just because of geography, because they were used as a way that people would have their boats sail through an area. What did Paul reply to Corinth? Paul says to Corinth, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame those who are strong. God chooses what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So as he closed, he said, to sum up, people ask me, Bishop, what is your vision for our diocese? What is the plan to accomplish what needs to be done. He answered, I assure you it is no gimmicks, no programs or analytics, but spiritual strength and progress have always been the result of humility among God's people, confessing our sin, acknowledging that we are completely dependent upon Almighty God. So what's the answer to the vision? Put our heads on a swivel and look around us. Because the answer, quite simply, is you. You are the reason that others in Seacon Island, in the South Jersey area, will be reached with the gospel. As you confess your sin, remember that revival begins with you. And ask, God will use you in the process. It begins with humble prayer, asking God to bring someone into your life who he has prepared to hear the gospel, who is struggling, who does not believe and does not understand, that you'll have the opportunity to share your faith with them. Pray daily that you'll have the opportunity to help, whether it's a member in your congregation, a member of your family, a neighbor, possibly, to find a way to assist them tangibly in what they need so that you can show them Christ by how you're living. Daily asking how you can, how the Lord can use you better to help make St. John's, to help make our church reach this community for Christ, the community that does not want to hear God's word honestly has to say. Um, we read in our Old Testament lesson a, a wonderful passage from 2 Corinthians. Um, and I'll read again a portion of this from chapter 7, beginning verse 11. And I'll skip down a little bit here. Solomon finished the house of the Lord, and then the Lord appeared to Solomon and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts or to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, 
and I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, our nation may not have a, a great famine due to lack of rain, and maybe that's a technology thing, but we certainly have a famine of holiness in our nation, godlessness. We see this daily when we look at the news. We see violence. We see the worship of money and luxury. And we may not be overrun with ravenous locusts, but it's very easy to see how our Judeo-Christian heritage is being devoured bite by bite, so much so that the name Christian is a stigma in our society. The question is, of course, where is the house of the Lord? That was God's promise there to Solomon. Well, Solomon's house. Well, honestly, his children, they didn't listen. They didn't turn. And God took them away into captivity with Nebuchadnezzar, and the house was destroyed. They came back after repenting, as God promised. The house was rebuilt, but once again, they turned against the Lord. When the Christ came, and it was destroyed once again by the Romans. Where is it today? Here's what St. Paul says. We are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And again in Hebrews, it says, now Moses was faithful in all God's house, that's a tabernacle, as a servant, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, not just a servant. And we are his house, not just in his house, but we are the house, the church if we hold fast our confidence and our boasting, not in ourselves, but in our hope in Christ. So hopefully you can see by this how you are the key to revival. Because we are the house in which the Spirit of God dwells. And if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That is God's promise. May God forgive us of our complacency and negligence there as we pray you know, for those things we have left undone that we ought to have done and the things we ought not to have done that we have. And may he have mercy on us and bless us as we continue to serve him in the spirit of Zechariah 7, verse 6, where it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And let us pray. Lord, we pray that as we come before you, often we think we are not good enough to serve for you and help us to realize that it is you who works through us and that our job is simply to be willing to let you do the work. We confess to you quite often, Lord, that for many reasons we fall short. We don't do the things we should and we oftentimes question whether we are capable and we should know that you are the one who is capable, beyond all that we could even ask for, or even think. We pray, Lord, you will use us as your instruments to build your kingdom here on earth. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our reflective hymn is 165.
Nancy and family, for Bill, Joseph, Phil, Susie, Betsy, Karen, for Tim and his job situation, for Linda and her uh, searching for a new residence, and Brian, and for Lori, who is sick this morning. That may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their suffering, and the happy issue out of all their afflictions. This we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Together, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we the unworthy servants, give you humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all of you. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love and redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of the Lord. And we pray to us such an awareness of all your mercies, where our hearts may be truly thankful. And we may declare your praise not only with our lips, but in our eyes, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to him with you and the Holy Spirit, we all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully accept us who have now made our petitions and prayers to you. And grant us the sanctity of asking faith according to your will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all ever more. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 490. Thank you.